as uh, Anna Salam, the editor of the Visual Journalism team. And what that is, is something we created really only 18 months ago. Uh, we brought together the television designers at the BBC News, together with the online developers, designers, and journalists who make all those kind of really cool interactive things. And we brought them together as one team. And in fact, uh, joining us uh, in the next few months is also going to be our picture editors. So those are the, the really kind of whizzy video editors who put together all the reports that go out on our television news channels. So uh, a happy, visual, focused, creative, I hope, bunch. But obviously coming from very different backgrounds. Um, and why did we do that? Well, we did that because we wanted them to do this stuff. But we wanted them to do this in a cross-platform way. We're interested in how can we learn from each other across TV and the web? Uh, what happens when you bring people with those different skills together? And what can we do to innovate where TV meets the web? Quite exciting, really, and happily kind of where we sort of think as a big broadcast we ought to be. Um, this is our multimedia newsroom. So uh, the team I run is a, a, a very much a cross-platform team, as I say, working uh, to do stuff that works both on, on both platforms. This is our newsroom, which is this big newsroom in uh, Oxford Circus. Uh, if any of you watch a BBC TV news bulletin or our domestic news channel, you'll see this behind the presenters uh, every day. That's, that's the view you get. You get this newsroom. And you can see that... Um, there are uh, all sorts of people in that newsroom, people from television, we have people from uh, online, and we have people from radio. But they still tend to work, even though they're in the same room and the communications are better, they tend to work in a very kind of mono-platform way, whereas the visual journalism team is increasingly working across those platforms on the same project. But uh, before I really get going, I just want to make one really clear point. <laughs> that however much BBC News may, may change and innovate and change in this kind of digital world that's upon us, we're never uh, uh, going to lose what's really at the heart of BBC News, which is that commitment to impartiality, the importance of our audience and our audience trusts us, the fact that we stay very audience-focused as far as we can, um, and that above all, that whatever happens in our newsroom, whatever stories may happen, we retain that cool clear-headed, not overexcited way of approaching it. And I think this next clip really demonstrates that in full. It's about to be shown there. It's taking a bit longer than perhaps was planned because of the media scrum that's developed at the top of the newsroom there. But uh, let's join the Queen now. So you were very well behaved, all of their desks working hard, not afraid by the Queen at all. Presenters are now realising it's the Queen, and he can't resist this. So I think, you know, that just shows you that we will always remain those core values at the heart of everything we do. But, going forward... What's uh, visual journalism bring to our audiences? What are the audience challenges that often they say, oh, you know, you're not that, or you're not the other. What is it that visual journalism can really help us with? So, I think the first one is distinctiveness. You know, in a world where we all follow a fairly, at least a fairly similar core media agenda, you know, today we're all doing the story about the Ukraine, we're doing the story about UKIP <coughs> if you're a, 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 a British broadcaster, we're all kind of often chasing the same interviewees. How can we stand out in that crowd? And one of the ways we can stand out is with really good visual storytelling. Uh, secondly, liveliness, modernity. The BBC is known as now, um, I think it's called a heritage brand in this new world. We started in 1922, so we're sort of old, aren't we, and fuddy-duddy and old-fashioned in how we do things. No, we're not. And our visual journalism is one way you can really tell the audience very, very clearly, hey, you know, we may not be BuzzFeed or whatever, but we can do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, and then obviously understanding, and that should, probably should have been at the top of the list. You know, that there's only ever any point in doing any visual journalism if it really helps understanding. Somebody said yesterday how, you know, our brains kind of remember visual things even more easily than they remember words. And, you know, building on that, that visual journals can really help people understand a story. And so those are the three things I'm going to kind of take us through a bit today. So, first of all, let's start with distinctiveness. The great British class calculator. Who's done it? 
Ah, oh, you see, you're not alone. Seven million people did it. Um, let's do it together now. I might lie a bit, but don't worry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, and I, I only earn that much. And, um, and um, I know, now this is true, I know a university lecturer, Alan. Um, I know a lorry driver, my brother-in-law. Uh, I know a farm worker, I used to be one, I milked cows for two months. So that's enough, that's all the only people I know. And so what I'm doing is I'm kind of filling in the sort of information that this calculator needs. I listen to a lot of hip hop. Um, uh, uh, to tell me what I am. And I am a traditionally working class person. I may have just told a porcupine to in that. In that. Sorry about that. But it's just the point. Um, we work with a lot of academics uh, to come up with a methodology, uh, a beautiful design from our designers, and um, it told you something about yourself, very, very personally relevant. Uh, this result is a shareable result, and lots and lots of people shared it. Um, some of our uh, rivals wanted to embed it in their sites, and we let them. So uh, the Daily Mail, let it never be said that the Daily Mail and BBC cannot come together. Um, and uh, also as far, as far afield as Le Monde, in fact, in France, um, uh, also used it. So this was a really big hit, and it was a hit because it was a lovely uh, piece of journalism, but it was also a bit of fun. And it was also very shareable. So, uh, you know, that was, a, uh, that was a big hit. But what did we do? We did something more than just make it an online thing. We gave that calculator on a tablet to one of our television reporters. And we said, go and make a piece of television about it. And this is what he did. You can work out your own social class using a test on the BBC website. Do you know teachers? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, do you know any lorry drivers? No. Do you listen to classical music? Do you do any arts and crafts? Do you use Facebook or Twitter? No. Do you socialise at home? Do you work the grove? Yeah. Do you go to museums and galleries? Yes, all the way now. You belong to a class, a newly defined class, called the Emergent Service Worker. You belong to a <laughs> class which is described as the established middle class. So, you know, this was a package, a report went on our main TV bulletins and played on our news channels all day. And this is what happened to the traffic on the website. Those three peaks are our three news bulletins. So the first peak was at lunchtime, the second peak at six, and the third peak at 10 o'clock. And that is the power of cross-platform. If you bring these things together, you can expose your journalism. And okay, this was a bit of fun, but we do more serious things too, like I promise we do. Um, but you can expose your journalism to far greater numbers of the audience, and that's really important for the BBC. Everybody pays a licence fee, um, 150 quid a, a year to access the BBC's uh, uh, TV, radio and online uh, journalism, and it's really important that it reaches as many people as possible for us. Um, we do these calculators a lot. We've kind of made them our own, really. Uh, and the key to them is that they are so personally relevant. We've done ones around uh, how much fuel you pay, um, what our budget, which is the sort of yearly announcement of taxes and spending, you know, what that means for you. Uh, we allow you to compare uh, yourself to Olympic athletes and find out which one you most match during 2012. And um, as I said, it's, it's enabling users to share that key fact that really kind of generates reach and uh, more audience watching. Um, I must say, I did the which Olympics athletes are you, and I wasn't Usain Bolt, I wasn't even Paloma Schmidt, but I think I must have, my finger must have slipped because I turned out to be a Chinese diver, which is <laughs> really, un really un <laughs> unlikely. Um, moving on, modernity. So that was distinctiveness, thinking about modernity. How can we show uh, that we are really uh, a very modern, innovative, um, organisation as far as news and storytelling and news goes. Well, we're very lucky. We have a big green room in uh, Broadcasting House. Um, it's, uh, uh, we call it Studio A and we use it for virtual reality. And that enables us to put our correspondence anywhere we like, really. Uh, this is our science editor, David Shookman. He is um, on the deep sea, uh, on, on the floor of the sea, as you can see. But we put correspondence in the middle of microchips, uh, we put them throughout on, this video. On the moon, you'll be able to click hot, and you'll see that David is in this big green room. But we projected all this other stuff. This is a story about deep sea mining. These events on the sea floor that are very rich in minerals, and mining companies want to get hold of them. And uh, yes, lots of things happen. And 
And then sometimes it's more successful than others, but you'll see down the side of the, of the uh, screen these hotspots which I can click on, that pauses the video, I can find out more and read this stuff, and then I can uh, close it and go back to the video and keep watching. This was something we did about, well, pretty early on when we started. And it was our first sort of experiment into kind of, here's something we do on TV, this package went on television, how can we make that a bit more webby? That was one thing we did. And I think that absolutely made us feel pretty modern. And we got a lot of audience feedback. And we do every time we do something that's a bit whizzy, with people going, I didn't know the BBC did stuff like this. Oh, this is really cool. You know, is the BBC cool? And they all kind of, you know, they get very confused. Um, um, this is one, this is like one of my favourite ones, and this was how we used an awful lot of video into this and put it into this uh, web experience. Um, interestingly, I went, though didn't understand most of the really interesting talk about uh, WebGL, and we used WebGL for this. Um, I'll go big screen. Uh, anyway, we used... Um, uh, WebGL so that if I could make it work, we could uh, manipulate this uh, 3D model, which was made by one of our television designers, our 3D television designers, taken onto the web by one of our uh, developers and made into a, uh, a movable, clickable feast uh, by, um, you know, that works on the web in a different way. Um, up here, there's a lot of video. I'm going to show you one. Um, this was a collaboration with Imperial College, by the way, who did a project which was if we could go to Mars and we could get a human there, how we get them back and what would they do when they were there and what would it be like. And so this is them in our virtual reality studio again where we mocked up the kind of craft it might be. And these are actually scientists. These could be a lot of you in this room. This is their first ever time. They were really good at it. So welcome to our virtual spacecraft, this is a mock-up of the real thing and at the moment as you can see we're in a weightless environment, that means we've just taken off of the Earth and we're in Earth orbit at the moment. We actually started our journey all the way back there, it used to be up, that's where we set off from inside the rocket. Uh, my colleague Dr Simon Foster is uh, working over there, he's monitoring stuff we have They're on natural. the screen so we can track. They're better than most of our correspondents. <laughs> but you can see the idea. We've, we've, we've mocked all this up in the big green room. They're standing there in a big green room acting, essentially, and also trying to kind of um, convey information. Um, and we're very lucky we have this uh, green room that we can do these things in. Um, one of them also, <laughs> we went to Leicestershire, where there's a quarry. And he dressed up in a Apollo kind of spacesuit, and, put, we put, and we put a sort of red filter over the video and pretended it was Mars. And I know, but it's it cool. So this may look like Mars, but in fact, it's this really is a location on Earth. And it's a particular environment that has similarities to the Martian environment. But you'll see how bringing video together with the interactivity, and you know, you're getting extra information down here. As I said, you could. We've got these WebGL models that you can explore yourself here. It kind of takes it to another dimension. And um, we won uh, an award for this for the best use of video on the web. And you know, as a broadcaster, we have you know, a lot of potential for making video. And we ought to be experimenting in this field. This should be somewhere where the BBC is having a go and experimenting. And boy, are we experimenting at the moment. Um, we're getting quite big into various different pilots with, with actually with outside companies as well as stuff we do in-house uh, around interactive video. So I don't know whether anyone actually knows whether interactive video is going to get, get big or not. Um, but, you know, as a BBC, we want to have a go and see, and see what's possible. This was a, com a company called Wirewax that we did a... Um, uh, an, uh, uh, an interactive video around um, the, the anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And um, it, was, it was pretty good, we kind of enjoyed it. Um, and uh, there were hotspots throughout the video that you could click on, and um, it kind of uh, got about a quarter of a million people, but we got an awful lot of reaction to it, and it was really useful to know what kind of worked for people. This was the next um, experiment we did, which just came out a month ago and was very timely because it was about the rise of 
Islamic State, or ISIS as they're now known. And this was using Mozilla Popcorn, which kind of essentially you embed a timeline in a video, and then things happen in other boxes on the screen, triggered by the timeline in the video. So I'll just let you watch a bit of that. Um, and you can see down here there's chapterization, so you can click on uh, and go straight to a, uh, one part of the video or back if you want to. <coughs> So this goes back to the kind of start uh, when Zakawi started a, uh, uh, his first embodiment of what became ISIS. And you can see what we've got here, we've got the video keeping going, we've got the text being triggered, and we've got a map. Um, and as we go through the chapters, you can see the chapterization moving along, I can interact <coughs> with these maps, etc. And what we found, guess what we found? People thought there was too much going on. They liked it, and again, everybody's saying like, oh, this is really cool, and I kind of like it, but I had to watch it, and then I had to watch it again before, before I really got it. And um, so that's interesting. So if you're interested in this, we're doing another one, which will be out uh, in the middle of September on child mortality in Malawi, and we stripped it right back, and it's based around an interview that's chapterized with graphics that accompany the interview. And I'm hoping that we'll have learned a lot from this and from the audience feedback, and we'll make something that, that is a bit less confusing, but also quite rich that you can explore. So that's the second um, thing we've been doing. And this is the third one. Um, there's a company in New York called Touchcast, who you can see it has linked up with for a year. And this is another kind of interactive video. So um, quite correspondent-led, quite often, with a correspondent sort of saying, <coughs> I'm talking about this, and then a web link will appear, or even an embedded hotspot, and he'll say, click on that if you want to know more, and you can click. So let's see whether we can make this work. This is the least likely to work. We are experimenting problems. Yeah, I don't think it's going to work on this browser. Um, that's one of the problems with it. It doesn't work on mobile, and it works on a, on a limited number of browsers. But you can see the idea. That's Mark Easton, our home editor. That's a web page, and he's referring to the web page, and I can click on it, and things happen. So lots of experimentation, especially around video. We do do a lot of things in-house that we develop completely. This was what we call Project 50P because it was so cheap. Um, but it's a tablet. And um, the correspondent can hold the tablet and press things, and things will happen on the screen behind them. I got a little clip of uh, our World Affairs correspondent Paul Adams in action using a tablet. Clear as the maps might suggest, but if you look at this map of Ukraine, you'll see that in the West, by and large, people are Ukrainian speaking, and they support the government in Kiev. The further south and east you go the more Russian-speaking and pro-Russian people are, particularly here around Donetsk and down here, of course, in the Crimean Peninsula. Now, why is the peninsula so important? Well, partly because of that large number of pro-Russian citizens, but also because for the last 200 years or more, it's been home to Russia's strategically important Black Sea fleet. So that's the kind of idea. You get a bit more of an informal uh, presentation rather than the correspondent kind of broadcasting <coughs> at you. It's a bit more conversational. Um, and uh, it, it allows the correspondent to be in control rather than the director in the gallery to be in control of what happens. Um, some correspondents find this extremely scary, but the directors find it even more scary because it's like letting the correspondents take over what's going to happen on the television, which is a very scary proposition for, for many editors and directors. Um, but it's another experiment, and it's particularly good for kind of geographical things, um, uh, things like you know where ISIS is going in Syria, that sort of thing. Um, but coming back to kind of that fundamental thing, understanding, that is at the heart of it. There's no point in doing any of this stuff if it doesn't aid understanding, and that's why you know the audience feedback for the new stuff we do is so absolutely important. Um, you know, this is a pretty straightforward flat graphic. It shows that um, police forces in Britain are recruiting, are having big problems recruiting young officers. And um, the, the sharpest fall in the number of young recruits is the darker colours. So you can see that if you are an agile young burglar 
in Devon, Cornwall, or particularly North Wales, you're probably going to get away with it uh, if you're being pursued by a rather portly older policeman. But you can kind of see that very quickly, and you can delve into the detail. There's a lot of detail um, uh, below the fold, but um, you can kind of get it in one go, and that's mm -hmm. the beauty of visual journalism. We sometimes enhance it because we are a cross-platform uh, organisation. We kind of use that branding that we use on the television, on big web stories. So here's the page that we have for Baroness Thatcher's funeral, and we use the same branding that we use on the television. It's just another visual clue for um, the audience that when they find uh, this web page, oh yeah, that is where I wanted to go. I saw it on the television, now I'm clicking on the web. And of course, as Bella, my colleague yesterday, was saying, um, you know, we're fully into responsive design. You know, we don't make anything that doesn't work on mobile, pretty much. Um, we don't ever intend to work, make anything that doesn't work on mobile, anyway. Um, but we also think about TV, which is something which a lot of people, when they talk about you know, designing across <coughs> platforms, they don't have the TV element, and we do. Really important to us. Um, and data. Data is a big area for us. So that we're increasing our, in our um, resource, putting our resource into that, taking away from some other things and putting it into data. We've got our data team, uh, our current data team here today. It's uh, John, Charlotte, and Ransom, who will be doing some workshops um, uh, after lunch today and tomorrow and I really urge you to go and talk to them about the stuff that we're doing the stuff which kind of they could probably talk to you about which probably has lots of letters and figures and things um, which isn't really my, um, my forte but we are uh, again bringing together um, uh, our teams from TV and from uh, online and thinking like how can we do something that works and one of the big things we're going to do very, uh, in the next few months is create a data storytelling environment using some of the lessons and some of the assets that we've learned from what we do on the web on television. It's quite hard on television telling data-rich stories because it's a linear um, experience and you've got to hit them between the head with a big number and otherwise they don't kind of remember it and they've gone before you know it and you register it. So how can we create an environment on the television that gives people the time and the visual clues to actually grasp data-rich stories in the same way that we do on the web. So that's quite an exciting thing that we'll be working on coming up. But here are some of the things that we've done. These are um, corruption maps. So this was research carried out by an organisation called Transparency International, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, um, uh, kind of mapping bribes being paid and all the sorts of different corruption and who, who were corrupt, what parts of societies were corrupt. And we uh, mapped them across the world uh, in lots of different ways. Um, you know, the, uh, the uh, most corrupt story, uh, most corrupt countries, least corrupt countries, corrupt in different ways. Um, and that was a really successful and quite popular um, global data project. And we'll be doing more global data projects rather than just ones that are relevant to the British audience as we go along. Some key principles, these are kind of like egg sucking principles, really, but I would pick out the last one. You know, you're only as good as the data. And if some data sets are a bit ropey, then they're ropey, and that means your journalism is going to be ropey. Um, I think the other one, number two, you know, you can bring two data sets together and actually draw a conclusion that isn't a conclusion you should be drawing. Uh, that's, a really big, that's a big danger for journalists, and it just really makes you aware that, you know, just, I think somebody was saying this yesterday in the um, afternoon sessions, you know, just because it's a graph or a chart or something doesn't mean it's true if you've got your methodology wrong. And we spend an awful lot of time and effort on our methodology. And we bring in, you know, we test it with outside experts who know more <coughs> about the field than we do. We make sure our in-house expertise, you know, our health correspondents or our science correspondents are fully involved to kind of sense check, um, you know, what, how we're calculating something or how we're doing something. And, and I think we spend, you know, I think that's one of the, probably the core and most important thing that we do when we do data journalism. So this was a project I was really, um, really proud of. It's the first kind of longitudinal data project that we did. Um, and as I say, the data team who are here today were very much involved in this. And this was using publicly available data that the NHS, the National Health Service in, in the UK, brings out every winter about how performance, how the hospitals are performing against various <coughs> targets that the government set. 
and particularly they look at accident and emergency departments. So big hospitals, not all of them, but most of them have big accident and emergency departments in the UK. And um, they have a target that everybody who gets there has to be met, has to be dealt with within four hours. And you might think that's quite a long time if you arrive in an ambulance, you know, having had a car crash or something. But unfortunately, an awful lot of people in the UK have come up with accidents and emergency um, with very um, small uh, 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 problems, and they tend to clog things up. Anyway, the government sets a target, and what you can do with this uh, postcode, you enter your postcode, this is my postcode, and what it will allow you to do is see how your local hospital, that's St Mary's in Paddington, is doing. I mean, this is now uh, not live because it's not winter anymore, but uh, we did it over four months, uh, updating every Friday morning the data to so you could see how your hospital was doing. So that was obviously not quite meeting the target for that uh, that um, week, um, we looked at how we were able to say how many people were there, how many emergency missions. You could look at how your hospital had done compared with the national average, uh, how many people were waiting on trolleys, um, how many ambulances were queuing outside the hospital before they even got to admit uh, admission, um, and whether they're having to cancel operations, uh, whether you know there wasn't a bed for you to go to if you needed to be admitted and whether winter vomiting virus was, uh, was prevalent or not. Um, and that, again, I suppose shows you, um, you know, what we're trying to do at the BBC. It's a very public service thing to do. This data is kind of available somewhere on the government website, not brought together in a way that people can understand or access very easily, um, and not made very personally relevant to them. Uh, and those are all things that we know how to do, and that's what we did in this, in this case. Um, and uh, that personal relevance is so important through postcode searching or through putting in some of your own details. Um, and this is one of my favourite data journalism projects before I ever um, joined the visual journalism team was um, USA Today, who took two data sets, which were all the um, Environmental Protection Agency measurements of pollution, although I think they have them about every five 50 metres or something, it's really lots of them all across America, and then match them to um, the location of America's schools. So all these parents could put in their postcodes and find out whether the air that little Johnny was breathing was good or not, which obviously then would have caused you know, quite a lot of local stories uh, and local pressure where the air quality was bad. And I thought it was a really kind of good example of bringing data sets together that actually did have a relevance and did have a meaning and was very um, useful in a public service kind of way. Um, I think uh, you heard yesterday how our, our news site, we, we now get more traffic, not just at the weekends actually, that happened in 2013, but more traffic from mobile than we do from desktop. So one of the things that we're doing along with everything else is thinking about what does that mean for our journalism, what does it mean for our data journalism? Um, and one of the things that we do is think about what can we do that's mobile and social first, rather than something that we've done on a desktop that just gets resized through responsive design and, and works you know, pretty well on, on mobile, but wasn't specifically made with a mobile audience in mind. Um, and you know, we've di dipped our toes in this uh, water, and we've called it Go Figure. It's a daily infographic. You get one or possibly two numbers on a main story. Uh, it might be a big um, uh, kind of serious story, or it might be a, a much less serious story. It doesn't really matter. Uh, my favourite is the goalkeeper, which is this extinct bird was found during the World Cup, and if you spread it out like that, it could have been you know, the ultimate goalie and stopped Brazil losing 7-1 to Germany. Um, some of the audience feedback said, yeah, but birds don't stand up like that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we produce one of these every day, uh, and um, uh, they go out, they're also made in five other languages, we have uh, uh, a lot of language services, so this gets translated into Russian and Turkish and Arabic, and, um, and uh, so they can either choose to just translate these, or they can make their own that are really relevant to their own audiences. Uh, and, you know, I don't pretend this is like, you know, high-end data journalism, but in a mobile social world, how can we... Uh, do something that is specifically focused on the mobile user that will entice them 
uh, to find out more about that story. All these stories come with a link back to our, um, our website with the full story. And we're finding a significantly higher number of referrals back of people who click on that link and come back to the big story um, than we do if we just uh, put a link up with a picture. It's something about the interaction of pictures and graphics or designs uh, and graphics that really entice people in in a way that a straight uh, bit of text or a straight photo, even though, even if it's really good, just doesn't seem to have quite the same traction. <coughs> Interesting. But, I'm coming to the end now, we all know that data can be very, very serious and it can also be quite a lot of fun. We also know that cats rule the internet. We all know that. So the sweet spot, right, is where we can get data and cats to come together. Yeah. So our really, really equally serious um, science strand on one of our big major channels, Horizon, it's been going for like 40 years and it's really very, very serious. Uh, they decided to make a program called The Secret Life of Cats. Uh, I'm just going to show you the trailer. <coughs> oh, no, I'm not. Hang on. I'm going to show you the trailer by clicking on it. Here it is. This is Lily, Coco, This is Obi, um, short for Obi and Kenobi. Oh, he's close. I know more or less what he wants. How much do we really know about our cats? Using groundbreaking technology, Horizon investigates. Really, is a sort of classic standoff. Horizon, the secret light of the cat. On BBC Two and BBC Two HD. We thought we'd got to have a piece of this. So, what did we do? We made a lovely web page. Look at this. This is absolutely beautiful. This, these designs were drawn by one of our lovely designers. And look, here's data. It's here. Let's click on it and see what happens. Right. <coughs> so, I'm really hoping this works. Loading. Come on. Yeah. So, what they did was they attached a GPS tracker to every cat's collar, about 50 of them. They also attract, uh, attached cat cams to about 15 of them. These ones, in fact, at the top of the page. So every cat, you could map the data of where it went every day, and you also could see what it did um, with this cat cam. Uh, and we had some really talented, as I say, designers doing these lovely cat designs and also um, uh, developers doing this fantastic mapping. So um, here's Orlando, he's my favourite. And look, this is where Orlando goes, this is where he went, this is his territory, this is Orlando's day. Well, it's about half an hour of Orlando's day because I think he spends 23 and a half hours on the bed sleeping. Uh, hands up, cat owners. Ooh, that's interesting. Normally it's much more than that. Think about that. Anyway. So you get, uh, you can click on all these cats, you can get their personal GPS tracker data story, you can find out a little bit more about him, um, you know, his history. He used to be feral in Hong Kong, in fact, and he never eats proper cat food, he just <coughs> hunts his own. But um, and I'm going to finish with this. Um, you know, this is something which every cat owner will know happens uh, whenever you have a cat. But it does show that, you know, data can be fun and we wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for the data tracker and the cat cam. <laughs> and with that, I'll finish. <laughs> Finishing the graphical web with cats. Uh, great. Um, questions for Amanda? Uh, thanks for that final image. That was really nice. Um, <coughs> so you, you're aiming to improve our public understanding. And, and I'm, I'm, I wonder if you, you've got any ideas about, about whether that's working in, in, in two senses. The first one is 
is these interfaces that you're building to groundbreaking new ways of telling a story. So, um, so is there any sense in which we're getting better at being able to navigate through, for example, interactive video? Yep. Um, are you able to pick that up through audience studies? And the, and the second sense is, is the, the message itself, if you like. Is there any sense in which you're detecting that we, the members of the public, are learning more about cats or Syria or ISIS or, or something like that? What sort, of, what sort of assessment are you doing on that? Yeah. Thank you. So um, whenever we do anything kind of new, we always put an explicit kind of request for audience feedback at the, on the actual page. And when we do that, we actually get a huge amount of people emailing us and contacting us. And we collate all that and we look at it and we say, what's this telling us? You know, once we've got two or three hundred responses, which is a pretty good kind of idea. And, you know, they're mainly verbatim, um, but they give us a good idea of, you know, I was confused why that was happening and I didn't understand that I should click on this bit. That kind of really granular stuff which is really important for us to understand whether we're getting that user journey right. In addition to that, we can measure the analytics of who actually clicked, how far they got through, what did they click on, um, and we can see, you know, we can, we can kind of see if there's a drop-off at some point and then go back and say, well, what happened at that point to make people stop clicking? You know, did we just have too much? Or did we uh, confuse them with something that happened at that point? So the, the combination of those two things, um, if we use that feedback properly, and as I say, you know, with the, um, the popcorn example, we'll be doing one directly um, you know, done, stripped back because of the audience feedback. We can actually learn quite a lot from that. As to whether they understand more because, sometimes those verbatims will say, I really like this, I really learned a lot, or I really, you know, I really particularly like this part of it because that told me something I didn't, want, I didn't know, but I'd like to have known more. And one of the things that we want to do in the future is at the end of an interactive is make sure that we showcase where they can find out more, where they can go on to get more in-depth stuff. Um, uh, also, I mean, I think, you know, we do, I mean, not our department, but our, our audiences department, we do a lot of monthly audience research which asks people, you know, who's the best for explaining a story, uh, how, you know, has your, you know, your understanding increased, that sort of thing. Uh, and I think, I, think, I think it's fair to say that our visual journalism is, a, you know, everyone thinks that is a, a key part of it, particularly things like maps on, on overseas stories and, you know, allowing people to find out more in their own time with key numbers and things like that. So, I mean, we have one of the BBC values is audiences are at the heart of everything we do, which I know sounds really kind of <coughs> clean and trite, but if, it, if they aren't, then what are we doing it for, really? So, um, we take that very seriously. Thank you, Thank you for your question. Um, have, when designing for uh, mobiles, uh, responsive design, have, have you found that you've needed to make, make any compromises in the clarity or the, the way that you get your messages across? Um, I mean, I don't think you, make, you necessarily have to make com compromises about clarity, but you obviously have to make compromises about how you lay it out. You know, it's a different size screen. Things tend to get stacked rather than be in one you know, page that you might think on a desktop, well, it's really useful to have that graphic while I can see this text. On a mobile, things tend to get kind of separated more as you go down. Um, but I, don't, I wouldn't say that we've made compromises. I think we're just sort of thinking all the time now about, you know, mobiles are different. People are doing different things at different times of day. They're in a different mood with a mobile. Um, and, and I think we need to be a lot more sophisticated as we see that mobile audience increase about, you know, not saying, oh, you know, it's interactive video, it will never work on mobile, or, oh, you know, it's this, it's too complicated to work on a small screen. I mean, I remember not very long ago, I worked on the Olympics in my previous job, <laughs> um, and I remember before we did the um, Olympics, uh, everybody's saying, oh, no one's going to watch the Olympics on their mobile. No one's going to do that. It's like far too small a screen. And even if they do, they'll only want to watch clips that are about 10 seconds long. They won't want to watch the video for very long. And I remember sitting in the Olympic Stadium 
in the gaps between things in the athletics. They never tell you about the gaps, right, until you go. And they're like, you're sitting around like, oh, well, there's a gap. Anyway, uh, so in one of the gaps, the guy next to me is watching the equestrian on his mobile phone, you know, in the gaps. So, because the Wi-Fi connection was terribly good. So he's watching the equestrian while we're waiting for the 100 metres or whatever. And I'm thinking, like, for, for ages, so like, for 20 minutes. And I think, I bet that's true. And when we got all the stats back from the Olympics, okay, it's a marvellous thing to want to watch, isn't it? But people were watching far more video than we thought. And even the kind of obscure sports that, um, you know, Greco-Roman wrestling, a personal favourite of mine, um, you know, people were watching it on their mobile phones for quite some time. And so people's behaviour is changing all the time in terms of, you know, broadband connectivity and costs coming down and I, I, I just I think we need to be focused much more going forward on, on what works on mobile rather than just you know what works on desktop and how can we make it work on mobile like that. Answer. Yeah, thank um, you yeah, I remember watching Mo uh, in the airport oh yeah my honeymoon so. Yeah, always amazing time, absolutely amazing. And by the way, Charlotte's here and she um, does a lot of our responsive design. So um, do talk to her if you want to know a bit more about that. Any more questions for Amanda? No one wants to know about my cat. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> gorgeous. <coughs> Hi, um, Hi. It was more about the journalism side rather than the other side. How, how do you find dealing with the kind of broadcast structures? Because it's very kind of classic, formulaed sort of delivery. Yeah. Are you sort of working with some of the journalists to kind of move away from that a little bit? Sorry, could you just speak up a little bit? Yeah, now? just that because of the kind of traditional structures of broadcast yeah. news. Yeah. Are you finding that doesn't work so well or is it working quite nicely for you? Well, I mean, I think when we started the um, team, I think it's fair to say that, you know, men were from Mars and women were from Venus. Um, there were very, very different approaches, and um, uh, I remember a, a particular interesting conversation between a, a, an online designer and a television designer around colour. Um, and of course, everything we do on um, online is sort of colour safe, if you like, for people who are colour blind, etc. And um, that's why some things are particular colours. And the television designer just couldn't get his head around this at all. They're like, what? <laughs> And never did television, or hardly ever, do television designers think in that way. You know, it's a different kind of medium. I mean, more seriously, uh, uh, I think the two media, it's, it's the way that the two mediums happen, one being linear and one not being linear, one being something you have to watch as the audience as opposed to interact with and control to some degree uh, uh, online. And those two things do mean that some of the graphics and some of the storytelling that we do has to be different because it's a different medium and it's a different audience. You know, when people are watching the television, they're very often in a much more laid back kind of mood still. You know, not that many people have smart TVs that they interact with that much yet in this country. I do have but, but they sit back and they watch and they want to be told. And, you know, most obviously, you know, as I was saying, you know, a graphic comes and goes in a number of seconds and it can't carry the kind of information that you can carry online because people can pause and stop and reread if they want to. So there are lots of things that are different. There's lots of technology things are different. We make things in different technologies, different file sizes, as I say, different colors. And bringing those things together uh, can be really difficult. But we, we started doing it particularly around our 3D and virtual reality um, uh, things because those are things that you can take onto the web and then do something different with and really maximise the use of. Um, more and more now we're thinking about you know how can we make some of our data projects really work on the television. I was talking about developing a kind of storytelling uh, genre for, for data for, for television. And I think you know the more time we spend together and the more we do together, the more <laughs> things start to kind of gel and work. Um, in our interactive videos, they might have a mixture of television graphics that are used as chapter heads in a video, uh, interactive <coughs> graphics made by the web teams that, that you can interact with or, or look at as a video shot by our television team, nothing to do with graphics, but our television team are making reports to television. So we're really bringing all those assets together as we should. But you know, we're learning and you know, there's such a long way to go. Uh, 
was thinking I ought to ask questions by row order to say <laughs> them on my... <laughs> You're getting some good exercise there, Alan. <laughs> As you didn't mention this, but I know from um, interactions I've had with BBC, R&D and others that mm. there's a certain amount of work going on around multi-screen viewing, you know, people having their smartphone while they're watching TV. Is, mm. is your team involved in that work at all? Well, you know, this is second screen, I think, is, is what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, how far do people sit there with their mobile devices, tablet or mobile phone, and watch telly and do something complimentary with it? So I think, I think what people do do is sit there with their mobiles and get involved in a conversation around a programme. Um, I've got a lot of evidence of that. Question time's the biggest um, draw for that. So, uh, and you really get something more from question time uh, if you're just sort of essentially watching straight, listening to the panel and you're either participating with or looking at the conversation around what the, what the audience are making of what they're seeing. Um, that really adds a dimension. I mean, I think obviously you look forward to the general election. You know, uh, is it possible that we can have something on the television and complement it with something on the mobile phone, almost in a sort of open university kind of way, where you might watch the television and they might say, well, look, you know, click on the app now and look at this story and you'll see a graph that yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about now. You know, would that work? I don't know. Um, I think R and D are kind of looking at it in a, uh, you know, in a much more sort of from a from a kind of technological point of view. Um, we look at things in kind of storytelling, and I don't. I think honestly, we don't really think about second screening. I think we still think that people use their devices maybe on the same story, but in different ways at different times of day, depending on where they are and what they're doing. So you know, the old desktop peak at lunchtime is still there. There's a television peak at lunchtime. There's a, 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 then a big mobile peak as people commute home. Uh, at, when they get home, there's another peak on television. And then tablets come into play later on in the evening. People sit in bed and look at their tablets. Do they do these two things in tandem? Not a lot. They might watch the television program and then go and do something on the web they've seen. The class calculator is an absolute, you know, people were definitely watching that piece of TV and going, oh, I'll find that and do it. So that's a trigger, but it's not like I'm, I'm, I'm doing it at the same time and they're connected in some way. I don't see a huge amount of evidence for that yet. It's something we should try. So, so um, I'm, tr I'm struggling to, to, to formulate this question, but there, so there are certain TV tropes that I see used a lot. and that like there's the correspondent, the US correspondent that's standing in front of this totally fake mm -hmm. background of the Senate or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you know that, oh, this is what, who's talking now. And, and so that, keep, that makes me think that for news, and maybe with the exception of sports, because I don't watch sports, but with, for news, very often the content is in the, in the text, in the talking, not in the images. So the images, mm -hmm. you could basically turn it off and just listen to the sound, and you would get the information just as well. That's radio. Yeah, that's why I'm struggling because I'm trying. I'm figuring. I'm trying to figure out why am I not. I don't agree with you that actually the information is always in the in the um, text. To be honest, I mean I think you know a picture tells a thousand words and it really does sometimes. But but that's why I'm wondering. So how would the data part work? Would that be? Mm. Would there be things that would be shown visually and you wouldn't necessarily repeat them in the text? Or Do you know what I, I, just, I don't know. I just know that you know it's an area that that we need to experiment with. I mean, is I mean, how many numbers can somebody take over a period of two to three minutes, which is the sort of average length of a television report? How many numbers can they actually take in and understand? What visuals do you need to go with those numbers to really make them stick and explain them? You know, maybe we have to be quite playful about how we do this. And maybe instead of thinking about, you know, it's like an algorithm and it's an equation that's a big figure and it's a graph, that we need to think a little bit more like of images that go with figures that really stick. I don't know yet. Um, and I'm really up for any ideas from that anyone might have. But there's a real danger of overload. And, and it just you're right, just washing over the head. But equally, you know, numbers and facts and figures are, we know are things that can really bring a story you know home 
and we've got to kind of see whether we can kind of bring some of the lessons that we've learned, even from our web uh, experiences, to, to bear on our television audience. Maybe we'll fail. Any more questions? Okay. So, <coughs> who are you in competition with, and who are you inspired by? Mm. Who are you trying to emulate? Mm. Well, I guess, you know, on, in the domestic sense, uh, on um, the television side, you know, uh, the old rivalry between BBC and ITV is still very much with us. Um, uh, and uh, obviously uh, lots of newspapers uh, in the UK are getting into the digital world, particularly the Telegraph and actually the Times and doing it really well, so there's competition there. I guess um, we would also think about ourselves globally much more than most of those organisations, mm -hmm. except for The Guardian, which, you know, I think, in answer to your second question, you know, I see lots of things on The Guardian that I think are fantastic. Um, and really, you know, took things forward like Firestorm. I really enjoyed looking at that last year. Um, but also, you know, their data blog is a great idea. And I, and I know it's not necessarily read by lots of people, but reputation is very important. And it gives them a place to just tell little data stories, which I think is very valuable to, you know, a, a, a number of people. Um, but in the global sense, you know, we'd be uh, competing against, you know, CNN, uh, Huffington Post, you know, all these big organizations. I mean, in terms of what I'm inspired by, I mean, I think some of the kind of um, sort of new kids on the block and their ability to just sort of come up with an idea that is really good, you know, the BuzzFeed listicles and things like that. Um, and you just sort of think, God, that's a good idea. And, you know, we need to think about that. And actually, that's why even though Go Figure is not, you know, highbrow journalism, I'm really proud of that because it does, it really works. Lots of people love it. And it just is kind of, you know, a good idea. And it's not a, you know, really highbrow idea, but it's a really good idea. Um, and so I'm pretty inspired by a lot of those people. I think in terms of um, the company that we all kind of look at at the moment on, uh, in terms of video on, uh, online is Vice, um, who do um, a kind of video, quite a risky, very personal video, sometimes in situations that other companies would find quite hard to be in. Um, um, but, you know, the, the way that they make stories exciting and come alive is something to kind of really emulate as well. So, I mean, there are just so many, you know, really amazing start-up and uh, different, you know, organisations out there to emulate, you know, and we, we do spend quite a lot of time just looking at what our competitors <coughs> are doing and, and going like, gosh, I wish we'd done that. But, you know, I, what I do know from going to lots of these sorts of conferences, and sometimes within the BBC, we kind of beat ourselves up a bit and think, oh, we're, you know, we're not as good as that. Actually, lots of people always come up to me and go, like, I really love that thing that you did about, you know, cat. Um, a lot of people come up and ask me that. But, but no, but, but more serious things. I mean, you know, they come up and they sort of say, oh, I really think that's, a, that, you know, the BBC's innovating now. Well, that was a really good piece that you did about that. And, you know, you do some really good stuff. And, you know, it does go both ways. We're not, we sometimes are our, our own hardest audience. Um, but there's so much to admire out there. Um, I think there's plenty of people inspired by the BBC. So uh, thanks to Amanda for our closing. Thank you very much.